want to thank our sponsors. Justforpolice.com, a grassroots service reward program established for police officers buying and selling real estate. Jiu-Jitsu50.com, a lifestyle brand training resource for law enforcement officers, providing technique videos, blog articles, promoted courses, and the latest in apparel and gear. Jiu-Jitsu50.com. Storm Training and Consulting, offering courses in firearms, tactical emergency medicine, and the Tactical Rescue Challenge. Stormtraining.org. Manchester Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a.k.a. Bushido, located in Manchester, Connecticut, a staple in the Jiu-Jitsu community for over 20 years. ManchesterBJJ.com. We got episode 16 of the Code Podcast. My buddy Rich McKeegan, a.k.a. The Scarecrow, and our good friend Luigi Mandelli, American Top Team, Cor Bushido, Danbury, Connecticut. How you doing, sir? I'm very good and uh, very happy to see your faces here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were just telling me right before we went live about your, 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 one of the things this has made you think about this whole COVID thing is you want to spend more time with your friends. Exactly. I think um, during this break, I, I was reevaluating a lot of things, I guess, like many of us and and that's one of my number one resolutions now is to take some time stop by at my friends places like you know go see you guys and uh and other friends and just to train to have fun and uh, to get some ideas to share more i've been trying to be more in contact with everyone um to see how people have been doing and maybe giving some tips of what i have been doing and and to learn, you know, see like how we all can go through this. You know, I don't want to see any other martial arts schools closing anymore. It just saddens me a lot. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really tough. And, you know, Rich and I talk about it every day. And it's just, uh, you know, you know, we're concerned, uh, as probably you are, that once this all gets back to, back to normal as possible, uh, that they don't start with the whole second wave stuff, you know, this fall and put us back into the same position we're in now. Um, I was. I just. I just saw a post that Trump said that he won't do. He won't uh, do any lockdowns anymore. Or, you know, I guess they're gonna take a different approach. And especially because now they might know better how to handle this. And we just need to take the politics out of the health issues. And and that's the biggest problem that I saw. And not just here, honestly. If you guys think that's just here, because I follow the Brazilian news too exactly the same as but it's exactly the same things um that's one thing i wanted to ask you really you know very is um you obviously you came from brazil you lived yep. in, in that country and you if from my understanding of conversations with you in the past one of the reasons you left is just the direction that everything was going there um is that true absolutely so uh brazil has a long history of let's put it this way first so if, if um just interrupt me if I get too long with this explanation. Brazil has one of the biggest economies in the world, right? But at the same time, one of the biggest Gini coefficient, which is the coefficient that defines a inequality in this specific demographic, right? So everywhere in Brazil, from micro to macro, we see a huge disparity when it comes to equality. And Brazil was a very prosperous country. Uh, especially Second World War, after the Second World War, because we were neutral. And actually, we were supplying a lot of uh, the materials that, for, ins for instance, like Brazil supp supplied a lot of the rubber using in the U.S. Uh, military, you know, structure, infrastructure. Uh, Brazil was supplying a lot of um, commodities to the rest of the world. When, when the Second World War ended, and the whole communism uh, started in the Soviet Union, Brazil became a, a really strong target uh, to the communist countries, to Soviet Union pretty much, right? So same thing that we saw in Cuba, we saw an attempt to have that implemented in Brazil. The biggest problem is Brazil has, I think it's the fifth biggest country in the world, uh, area size, if I'm not wrong, six or uh, fifth or sixth. And the proximity with North America, even though like we're in a different hemisphere, but imagine like the size and logistically Brazil would be like perfect situation for Russia to be right there, right? Right under the United States. Imagine that they, they try to get the missiles in Cuba. They, if they have put in the north of Brazil, they will have reached here like easy. 
as well. So Brazil went through a lot of, um, and still goes through a lot of this influence from socialism as it is, not social projects, which is a whole different thing. Heavy socialist, uh, leaning really towards more communist communism. And because of those things, uh, in 1964, the military, they say with the help of the CIA, had really good intel as far as like um, the revolution that was brewing to make Brazil become a communist country. And in 64, the military took over. So they did a, um, what did they call it, a coup? Um, I think that's the word, right? Yes, a coup. And yeah, so it, people say that was a dictatorship, but actually it wasn't a whole dictatorship. Because the military would assign a new president every four years that would be pretty much a general um, or high patent, um, someone from the army or the army forces, they shut down the Congress and the Supreme Court in the beginning because everything was corrupted. But later on, they reopened the Congress and the Congress would vote and on the next maybe president until Brazil in 82 or 86 reopen to become a full democracy again. But all the, the institutions were very already um, indoctrinated with the socialism, um, heavy influence in an educational system and etc. So long story short, Brazil is highly socialized, let's say, <laughs> I don't know if that's the word, or socialist, um, super heavy taxation. But I mean, like, if I, we can do a whole podcast about just taxation and um, heavy in protecting the, la or the labor laws, they are insane and don't promote um, the growth of the country because it's really hard to have employees there. It's extremely expensive. And all these things contribute in uh, having a very, it's a country that is really hard to start something from scratch, like here in the United States. You know, I always say that I came here with a thousand dollars in my pocket, that everything that I had first week I was working um, in multiple jobs. Fast forward 17 years later, have my business, uh, you know, 200 plus students and making my living. So in resume, uh, summary here, I can say that at least like still when I came here, we could build a life and live the American dream, you know? When did That's you come here? 2003. 2003, and when did yeah. you open your academy? Well, I could only open my academy, just me and Sylvia, my wife, uh, in 2010, like hours, like 100% hours. Before I had my programs, so I started in a community center in Danbury. Um, uh, a guy named Bill Curtis, he was the first one to open doors for me and was a, um, a very poor community center behind the church. I was there for a year and then a friend of mine and one of my students hooked me up with the Newtown Park in Rex. So I was teaching at the Newtown, Park, uh, Newtown High School at night for maybe uh, a year and a half. And then I start subleasing a karate place here in Denver. And I was there until 2010 or end of 2010, beginning of 2011. But because the deal was terrible for me, it was 50, 50%. And later on, they uh, want to move to 60, 40, 6% for them, 40% for me. I was paying way more in that share. You know, so I, I, uh, we put t uh, together our savings and Siva had more savings than I had. And I had the students, we found this place and we moved and we have been there since, yeah, I think beginning of 2011. So it's going to be like um, nine years this year, almost 10 years nice. that we, all we do is that. Yeah. Now I, I always get confused at this part. It's like, uh, were you a part with Glover Teixeira? Cause I know his, he had a striking gym right next door to you, right? So Glover, Glover and I met in 2003, and he was a blue belt, if, I wasn't wrong, if I'm not wrong. And he trained with me. And um, I think, I, I don't remember exactly what year, maybe 2007. He had to go to California, and then he was there helping Chuck Liddell until to get his paperwork straightened out with immigration, he had to go back to Brazil. 
So fast forward to 2012 when he returned to um, when he returned to United States. He came back to Connecticut where his wife uh, was living here. So she was going back and forth to Brazil, and he was pretty much going to California to train and train here at our academy at you know our ATT school. And I was gonna double the size of my school, get in the garage next door to me. Uh, so he could have, I uh, could hold more classes and he could have a dedicated place for MMA, for him, for his own training. So he said that uh, he would like to get that size. It was, so we were independent. Uh, I still had my size, one garage door, you know, cause he's, this is a kind of like, a, not big warehouse as where you guys are, but a little smaller but we have those garage doors. So he got the next door. I hooked him up with all the setup. So after he came back from Brazil, everything was set up for him. And I got a few sponsorships for him to get the plumbing, the sh and other stuff. So he was running his school next to me, little like door to door. But I was teaching, of course, Jiu Jitsu, MMA, kickboxing or Muay Thai. And I'm strictly martial arts, and he had his MMA training, professional training there. Some of my guys were cross training there on a daily basis, and um, and then he had a fitness and kickboxing. But then he started teaching jujitsu there, and then things just started like getting weird, and um, he ended up. Uh, we I end up not working with him anymore um, after. I think it was 2016. I made a decision to you know, just um, focusing my school. And so he opened on, he moved out of there to a new place uh, in Bethel, which is a mile from me. But um, so now he has a full MMA school there with jujitsu and everything too. You oh, know, okay. but he got his black belt from me. Yep. Were you, do, you, do you still watch him fight? I kind of got disappointed a little bit with MMA. So I, um, <laughs> I kind of like hover out of there. I felt that... Um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu really creates a different type of bond between people. And sometimes I don't feel the same thing when it comes to MMA. Um, so I decided to move away from MMA. I dissolved the team. I kept training people, teaching, but with no uh, intentions to make new MMA fighters. I had really good people that with me. Dan Kramer was the first guy um, under me to fight in the FC. Uh, Ryan Quinn was it's like a son to me. And then um, I I told him to move to Florida, go train at ATT there full time. He was a Bellator fight, fighter. And he's one of the instructors there. He's a guy that I love very much. And many other good guys, you know, but I, I kind of decided to move away. But now, like Silva says, like, I try to move away from MMA, but MMA tries to keep getting closer to me. Um, some new kids and good people uh, have been asking me to get them ready, you know, so I'll see how I can, how far I can get them until I tell them to go somewhere else. If I cannot, you know, keep helping, but so I might start training people again professionally. So, <laughs> you know. Now you're under eight American top team, right? You yeah. So, that. yeah. So uh, um, my first coach, uh, my first team in Brazil, we were under Carson Gracie. And um, after, of course, they split, we, my, my head coach there from the team moved to another state. Long story short, um, I had to move and I ended up, not because I wanted, but it's just circumstances like, you know, Brazil was very hard to just switch teams, but I moved from one uh, town to the city. And I had to train with my former coach, another former coach that went to Brazilian top team. So when I moved to here, I was a still Brazilian top team. And Liborio, that was one of the co-founders of American Top Team, invited me to be um, to represent ATT here in Connecticut. And so that was since 2004. And they granted me with a f lifetime license, so I don't have to, you know, pay any uh, franchise fees or anything like that. But also, I do my best to promote as much as I can ATT, and all my fighters always fought for American Top Team. And so, the, and I, and actually, we were the first ATT school out of the headquarters to 
put a someone in in UFC. And uh, so I guess like the guys who like me, I like them. They have been always really good to me, and you know, so I kept my loyalty. You know. Now, how did you get involved in martial arts to begin with? I know it's been a long journey for you. You've trained many, many years, but I always like to hear like what yeah. prompted someone to get into the martial arts and how did it all start for you? I got bullied um, in Brazil. I, I was the biggest, tallest guy in my high school and uh, or middle school. But I was, my mom used to make me go to an English school, uh, separate English school. And I was the youngest at the, you know, the class. And I was getting bullied by two guys. And one day I couldn't like run away and I had to fight. And I became over aggressive and I really like lost my mind and I started like beating this guy and that was older than me, but it's not like I knew what I was doing and anything. And I felt um, a little out of control, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I was like maybe 13 years old, 14. And I started looking at, uh, I, I felt like I needed to learn something to help me out to maybe be more assertive and um, because maybe I wouldn't get in a fight if I was more assertive. And I found a place that was teaching Kung Fu. Um, so that's my beginning was in Kung Fu in uh, Wing Chun. And then I moved to another style. And then I got interested in Sh Shotokan, uh, karate, and I trained in Judo too, boxing, and then Jiu Jitsu. I started and I stopped and I restarted again. So, and then has been 32 years since I've, I've been that path with Jiu Jitsu, I guess. 30, 31, 32 years, about that. Wow. Um, go ahead. No, no, yeah. So I, I think it was, um, it's mo it was mostly uh, from that uh, perception or the self-evaluation, like, you know, I was a big guy that didn't know how to fight, and, um, and I felt like I need something. And I like the philosophy, though. So I looked for something that had history and maybe some – I know tradition and philosophy, so that's how I I, uh, I kind of resisted getting into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu too, because in Brazil had a little bad reputation in the beginning, you know. Until I found a place that people were very respectful, nobody used to fight in the street, anything like that. So I felt um, that was the place for me. Now, when when in your life did you decide to like, hey, you know, I want to make this my my life's work. I want to do this full time. I want to. Uh, this is what my career is going to be. So um, in, in 2000, that's when I quit my job. I had a corporate uh, job. I, I'm a system analyst, so I'm a computer engineer. And I worked for this corporation. And man, I used to get so stressed with not being able to go to class every time I had to do overtime or something like that. So I quit my job in 2000 to 2001. And I started working with my, uh, in my family business so I would have more time to train. And then in 2003, I made a decision to just like Luigi 2.0, going to go to the United States and, uh, you know, uh, forget about computers and stuff and just like maybe become a teacher, you know. So that's how, that was the year of the change. <laughs> And then changing country, changing everything. <laughs> that wasn't, wasn't easy, though. <laughs> so since you've been doing jujitsu, and it's like, I mean, that's from 2003, it's like I've seen the changes from just like, say, 2007 and on. It's like you must have seen so many changes in the jujitsu jiu realm. It's like, where do you see it going from here? Look, first thing, I'm thankful that things has been changing to – become a community that is more friendly and we see that like we haven't seen that getting even more and more so teams that are getting more along people dropping a lot of the politics i'm from a time that if i just mentioned that i had a friend from gracie baja or alliance people would look at me like you know <laughs> so um i came from a very very old school uh, mentality and it was so rigid. And, and that's the whole thing. When I moved from my town, my hometown that is maybe 40 miles from Rio, from the city. And actually my hometown is where Helio Gracie had his, um, 
summer house or, you know, where he used to bring all his grandchildren there to train in Petropolis, Correias. Uh, that's a, a little town. In, it's also little, but. So I moved to the city and I couldn't just go anywhere because my family moved to the city. And so I had to ask my, um, my coach, like, where can I go train? Because, you know, I, I could not just flip sides, you know? It's kind of like in Brazil, you will be in this weird limbo area where you would never be accepted at the new place as a real full member. You know, if I had switched from, I'll give an example. Uh, Novo Nião, like where Pedeneiras uh, teach, uh, Jose Aldo used to train, was literally two blocks from my house, okay? Um, from my work with my father's uh, business, for instance, where I was working at some point, I had uh, De La Riva, maybe three blocks away, Alliance, maybe, I don't know, six blocks away. I couldn't go to those places because my former coach told me that the only place I could teach uh, to teach and not to train will be at my former coach. Um, and I had to cross, imagine like you're going from lower Manhattan to Harlem during rush time <laughs> every day. You know, so it would take me like one and a half hour to cross the city to go train where I was allowed to. So I could be accepted at my old team on the weekends, you know, and, uh, and then there, the new place, I would be welcome as, you know, a regular member. And they welcome me, uh, welcome me very well. Um, but those are the things that, for instance, Thank God doesn't happen anymore. If I have a student that lives in Manchester, right, closer to you guys, I would be the first one to say, like, you guys go, got to train with Rich and Rob, and that's the place to go. Back then, it wasn't like that, you know, because you still have no rivalry, but it was that competition team mentality. So thank God things changed where you can do host, for, for instance, the Black Belt for Butterflies. Right, you can have like people from so many different teams and help different causes, you know, the Mission 22 and uh, We Defy and all of those things and Girls With Grips and all these initiatives, I think, I believe that we will see more and more often and people getting closer and closer. And the teachers that bash other teachers and other teams, we're gonna see them maybe fade away and get isolated. You know, so I feel like that's the future of jiu-jitsu. People will, the community has to get stronger. I still believe that we have to get more united um, because in, in a situation like that, this that we're going through, uh, we could have used more support be, among everyone. And, and hopefully that's, that's what we're going to see, you know, this big um, community more like a stronger together. It's funny because I, I obviously didn't grow up in Brazil and go through the exact same scenario. But even when I started in the you know mid to late nineties, it was it was similar here, where it's like once you joined somewhere and, and you left there, you were a traitor. Like, yeah. <laughs> and and I have had many times over the years, not recently, but I would say all the way up probably through my brown belt days, where I would have friends that were from other academies, and they would want to come visit me, but they're like, oh, don't take, I can't get in the picture, I can't get in the yeah, yeah. picture. Don't tell anybody, don't tag my name because they didn't want to get in trouble. I haven't had that in a while, but it, it existed in my training too. Yeah, no, for anyone, I think that was under any uh, old school guy here. And, and, and look, I don't blame any teacher. I don't blame anyone for thinking like that. That's the way that we grew up, you know. And even I think maybe because within the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community in Brazil, even within the family, the Gracie family, they, they always had a huge rivalry sometimes between, you know, the different sides. You know, Carson Gracie, Gracie Baja, um, the regular Gracies, you know, like the, with the yellow logo from Helio's side. There was a huge rivalry between them as well, plus everybody else that branched off, right? And, and, and not in a bad way. Um, there are some teams that have, like, bad blood, between them in Brazil, but I think it was more like a competition thing, you know, like people want to like, I remember going to tournaments and seeing that these guys would open these huge flags and um, 
that would take the all the bleachers and and the lions and people would be like chanting like the the lions uh, 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 chants and same thing the guys from Gracie but it was beautiful to see you know the passion and but but the loyalty I think it changed from being a blind blind the loyalty say that you joined a place that you didn't know that was a bad place you're like you curse for life. You know, it's like you kind of you couldn't go like, oh, let me do a trial class here and then a trial class over there and a trial class over there. You curse for life. You're gonna be in that place. It's stuck, you know. And now I see loyalty differently. It's not based on fear. People don't fear their coaches anymore. So I want my students to be loyal to me because it makes sense, you know, because we are trying to do everything for them. And look, maybe my character is not like what they are looking for and then they can go someplace else and there's no hard feelings you know what i mean like so it's it's different uh nowadays i think the loyalty changed it makes more sense now yeah my coach always at the beginning when i you know i've been with him for well over 10 years now pedro sour was has never once told me not to go train somewhere else he in fact he encourages us he's like whenever you travel whenever you go somewhere bring your gi if you see a school stop in train you know he, he uh, uh, wants us to do that no, it's awesome. I used to travel a lot for work in in Brazil, um, almost every other week, and I could only go train in another sanctioned place. You know, and I need to make sure that w was within that bloodline. And even though I would still be a target, you know, like that's the visitor. You just like go kill them. You know, what I mean? so I'm like, mm. and and don't get me wrong, I had a bad maybe not bad but if a visitor came not that i want to beat anyone or that i want to go like crazy but because i was competitive i became competitive i would be next to my coach like can i go with that guy can i go with that guy you know and then sometimes my former coach would just look at me like okay where'd you go you know so uh but it was kind of like same feeling as going to a competition you know, just like you test yourself. And sometimes I will have my ass handled to me. So I just think, you know, whatever. Hard to believe a guy like you getting your ass handed to you. Cause oh, no, that, the size doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just like, you know. Do you think that this is uh, the reason that the change is an Americanization of jujitsu? Or do you think it's the technological advancement of like social media with the YouTube videos that there's like, there's no secrets anymore. Everything's being put out there. So there's no real reason to sit there and tell your students only train here. You don't want to train anywhere else. I think it's a mix of both. Um, I think in the United States, uh, we learned how to run a martial arts school better because the United States had a better tradition in uh, with the Taekwondo places, with the karate places. So the business model, even though we don't follow completely, right? But I think it was here was way more professional. And this is a really good thing. And uh, we saw the biggest, I guess, like you said, it's so right, after YouTube. And look, I remember, honestly, I would go to tournaments to watch sometimes. I get one of those VHS-C uh, cameras, sometimes even those big ones, and hide all the way back and record. So I could study things afterwards. You know, be, they are like, oh, let me record it. I hope nobody sees this, you know. And... Um, but nowadays, like, there's no secrets anymore. You know, omoplata is omoplata everywhere. A single leg X is a single leg X anywhere. Sometimes people come up with new things, and it's new until it's out there on YouTube. Somebody recorded, and they make a DVD. So I think it's a mix between technology and the proper way to run a martial art business, and which is a good thing. You know, we saw some schools getting more too commercial. And that's not a good thing. And I felt like I feel like now people are realizing that it's important to keep some tradition, as far as maybe the uh, how how long people should stay in each belt. Um, but at the same time, we have to modernize as well. And I think that one thing, Rich, uh, I think that now after this COVID nineteen outbreak, you are, going back to your first question. I see many schools now adopting things and keeping for the future. I'll give you a quick example. For the last 10 years, I wasn't thinking about this at all. And it was just like, um, I, because of my affiliation, 
I use Google Drive to record most of my classes, techniques, anything like, oh, let me record this. So I built over 10 years a library with maybe 1,500 videos, right? And I know people can have their YouTube, you know, there's enough on YouTube DVDs. But that's how I spread my curriculum to my affiliated schools. They're part of core. So every week I put my class plan or what I will be teaching here in Danbury. And if they want to follow, they can follow those things or, um, or the seminars from people that come here or, uh, or every time I taught a seminar. So I built that. Man, this, this thing became so handy now because I adopted uh, Google Classroom same thing that the kids use in school. And I just share. So assignments and material from my Google Drive library to my students. And um, so every other day, I've been teaching online classes. And the next day, I get something from my Google Drive and I post it there. So this is like technology now that maybe we're going to move and push forward. And now I'm going to keep the Google Classroom for my students because I saw like, well, maybe say that somebody's traveling for work and they want to see what I have been teaching or what I'm teaching that week. If they cannot show up, they can have access to the Google Classroom and see my assignments or the material that I'm sharing. So I'm going to keep that. And I also going to keep the Zoom classes or the new thing on Facebook uh, where somebody that is traveling can watch a whole day at American Top Team. You know, I had to buy web cameras and a new computer, so I might as well just keep using, you know. So I think we're going to see some techno technological progression in our methodologies, maybe, you know. That's, a, that's actually a really good idea. Um, now, you mentioned COVID. And... I got to ask you, we're approaching that June 20th date that the uh, governor of Connecticut has stated that um, as, as long as this first phase goes okay, we'll be able to, as you know, we're all classified as gyms, which you know, I have a problem about of us being classified as a gym. But anyway, we're classified as gyms and that's the date we're supposed to open. How do you, what do you feel um, in your mind you're going to do uh, as that becomes closer? I know they haven't even released what the uh, regulations are going to be, I guess two weeks beforehand, they're going to release them. But what are you planning? Do you have an, uh, a plan for that? Or we don't I, know, it's still unfolding. No, I, I came up with a five phase plan that I already um, shared with my students. I, I'm, I'm more than happy to share with everyone because again, um, my goal is to see all the martial arts schools striving and even my competitor, my competition next door. You know, I don't care. I, I want to see everybody doing well. So I came up with my own guidelines and um, that, uh, some things that I, uh, the guys, some guys from Sherry Row uh, shared with me when we had an online meeting and some other friends too. I could go over everything with you guys if you guys want to. Um, I know that we had talked earlier this week about it and you were pretty excited about it. You said you wouldn't mind sharing it with us, so I figured. Yeah, it was so uh, one, we, we will request our students to sign new waivers and contracts because I'm gonna put a clause where I would like, it's not tracing at all. I don't wanna trace anyone. I don't wanna do any spying, but I will be part of the agreement between the school and the, stu uh, the, school and the students that I would like to be informed if they get in contact, say somebody in their house, have COVID. So I would like to be informed because I might ask that students to wait two weeks before coming back to the school, you know? So that's one of the things. So it's not a tracing thing. It's for my own database. It's a precaution. Huh? It's a percent precaution. Yes. Um, so in the beginning of phase one, the students will have to schedule and reserve uh, their participation in each class. So the software company that we work with, um, they they came up with this routine so people can go online and, okay i'm going to the 4 30 class or the 5 30 class so i can keep a, a cap i'm i'm uh, all students cur current and new will have to acknowledge having watched the welcome to attct video health and safety guidelines so i'm just going to have a whole video explaining uh, everything that we do here to clean our school and what how they should you know uh say act 
so okay, so the video will provide instructions and inform our students about all of our new procedures, how they should monitor their health, um, educate them how to properly clean their uh, and wash their uniforms and equipment, kind of silly stuff, but you know, um, to avoid coming to any class and any sign of possible symptoms of a common cold and flu. And we're gonna test uh, the students with a, um, got one of those, uh, I'm getting another thermometer. I'm being extra precautious, but I might drop things if it, we don't need it, but at least like right now I'm putting it all the way out there. I know I'm a little overboard. Uh, okay, so I said that already before. Students will be asked to inform the school if he or she has been diagnosed with COVID-19, of course, or anyone in their household has COVID-19. So in both cases, we will ask the student to not attend to class. All classes will be broadcasted on Facebook group and Zoom. Uh, we're going to add more classes and only 10 students allowed per class. In phase one, our classes will be focused on physical exercises only. Uh, no equipment, only floor drills, calisthenics, and no direct contact with other students. So it will be pretty much a fitness gym, um, you know, and not a martial arts school in, in phase one, unless they tell us that we can have some sort of contact. But this is my prediction, <laughs> how we will have to open, you know. So in the beginning, um, um, marking squares in, on the mats, you know, keeping the social distancing. People have to come in one at a time. And um, let me see here, the students will be, they will have to help me cleaning um, any equipment and uh, whatever, you know, in their areas. We're gonna, um, the students might have to spray their hands and feet with disinfectant solution upon entering mats. So I, I increase the number of this alcohol dispensers and um, I have been using another disinfectant that is uh, not too harsh, so it's more natural. Um, the guy actually that came to sell was, was funny. He, he walked in trying to sell this thing, and he pretty much poured on his hand, and he, he kind of like licked and then swallowed the <laughs> disinfectant. Then he poured on the, on the mats, and he scrubbed it. And it was like, oh my God, this thing like really cleaned the mats. And my mats are pretty clean. I'm like, wow. And he goes, don't worry, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm like, okay, I trust you now. <laughs> uh, we will use, limit the use of the locker rooms and ask students to change as quick as possible. If possible, we will request the students to come already dressed up, if possible. No one will be allowed to hang out in the gym. We're going to have a lot of signs and instructions all over the gym. And... I bought a industrial size uh, three stage air filter that has uh, one of the stages is activated carbon filter that would be running on stop. So there's another pre filter and a HEPA filter that will run 24 um, seven. I have two commercial size ozone generators. Um, that's pretty much four times the recommendation for my size of the gym. And I will run them um, in the afternoon before the classes and at night it will run overnight and also we will they will run over the weekend so once i close saturday those on generators are going to keep running until um um monday on phase two i'm going to keep the limit of 10 students we will keep the same guidelines as phase one on phase two um we're going to start using more equipments and phase two might take just like a week or half a week. It depends on how this whole thing will go. Um, we're going to form groups of two or three people. So say that if I have a class with 10, I might have small cluster of people that will be mostly training among them only throughout the weeks. So say that, okay, the group are going to be Rich, Luigi and Rob. So we're going to try to keep the same little three um, group of three or, or pairs, at least like during the phase two. Phase three, the size of these groups will expand. So I'm limiting the cross training among team members, if it makes sense. Phase four, so we're gonna keep the phase one, two, and three. And stu students will be able to cross train with anyone within the group of 10 because it's I'm limiting 10 per class. And uh, phase five, um, we will cut back the extra classes and we will return to our pre-COVID-19. 
and I send this to my students like we are back to the old normal. I'm refusing to say new normal. <laughs> it's like old normal. I hate so, that. I hate it when they say new normal. No. Like no, no you're not gonna you're not gonna ram this down our throats. Look, look, Rob, the more I read about so many political things and what's coming up, they want a new normal. And and I'm I'm telling you, and I cannot emphasize this enough. I came from another country to live in in this country that for me is still the best country in the world. It can sound like arrogant to other people in other countries, but for me, this is the best country in the world because of the Bill of Rights. We don't have a Bill of Rights like this in Brazil. We don't have a freedom of speech like we do here. We don't have the right to defend ourselves. We don't have the, so people, are, if he or takes for granted, but I, I don't. And, and I understand that there are things that can get better in our society when it comes to the healthcare system, the educational system, and more equality, like every place in the world. But we cannot compare ourselves and lower, lower our standards and our freedoms to be like every, every place else that has been a monarchy or a colony or, I mean, we have been a colony here too, but there's a difference, right? Um, or a communist, part of the communist bloc, you know? And, and pretty much this defines everything that um, differentiates the United States from the rest of the world, <laughs> you, know? So, you know? I just saw in Canada, man, um, I don't know if you saw this video, like two police officers, and I know they're doing their jobs, get inside this uh, house with the two elder people and removing them, taking them to the hospital, they force them to go to the hospital. And they're like, I'm, we are fine. But I guess because of some tracing thing and um, they had orders to take those elder people to the hospital and they didn't want to go. That was in Canada? That was in Canada. Because uh, there's a case, actually it's a Connecticut case. It was a few years ago now, but um, there was a case where a, a guy had left the I want to say it might have been even like in the Manchester region. But anyway, this guy leaves the doctors. He um, had went there for some tests. And then the doctor tried to call him back. Uh, and he's not answering his phone. So they called the police and they said, hey, we want to try to find this guy. He needs to come to the hospital like ASAP by ambulance. Like he, he's going to die if we don't get him a treatment. Like he's, we, they just figured it out after he left. Like he had some heart thing. Something mm -hmm. I forget what the exact cause was, but... They, they put out this thing. So anyway, the, the police find him and they explain it all to him. Hey, your, your doctor called us. He needs you to go to the hospital now. We can get you an ambulance. It's, it, it's crucial. It's life and death. Um, it's not a joke. It's life and death. And he refused to go. He said, I'm not going. And um, they called the doctor back. So anyway, make a long story short, they end up um, committing him. They order him to go to the hospital because they figure that he's not thinking straight and it's his life is in the balance and his own doctor, it's his doctor saying he has to go. And um, he uh, didn't resist. He, he went, you know, he, verbally he resisted, but he did not physically resist. And um, he sued them and won. That uh, it was uh, his choice to live or die. Again, man, uh, it's like double standards. Like when um, I'm not making any point that, uh, pro or against abortion, I have my own opinion, but, but the, the biggest, uh, um, what's called excuse that they give is, okay, my body, my choice. So in that case, if you know you're gonna die, maybe you have cancer, but you don't wanna go through chemo because some people make that choice. They don't wanna, they don't wanna go through chemo. There was a girl here, she was 17 years old. And I guess like she, uh, she was forced to, by um, the child service or whatever, you know, department, the parents were forced to uh, get her in the chemo treatment. The girl didn't want it. She was 17 years old. And, and I'm not saying the chemo, it's, it's not good, but some people don't want to go through that, you know, and, and you choose how you want to die. It's just pretty much, you know, I want to choose, like, maybe I don't want to go through the suffering of maybe, you know, I don't know. It's just, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, I know that if I had cancer, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to have any chemo. I know, you know what I mean? I, that would be my choice. You know, I'd rather like. I've dealt, with, I've dealt with, I don't even know how many suicides, dozens and dozens and dozens I've had to, to deal with. And, 
uh, over the years, and it's not illegal. <laughs> it's not illegal to kill yourself. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like it isn't. I mean, how can you stop someone from committing suicide, you know, like sooner or later, which is a major mental health issue. Um, and, and we have to be compassionate with someone that uh, commits suicide. I see many people saying like, oh, those people are selfish. No, they're not. They're like sick. And, and then sometimes life is just too hard for them. I'm not, you know, advocating for suiciding at all. You never know um, someone's battling. Yeah, exactly, man. It's just like, you know, for some people, life is just too hard and the brain is, is damaged um, in a way that for them, I don't know, it's just they don't think like we do. They don't have the same cognition as we do. Um, but, but I've been around people with depression and I have friends that have lost uh, loved ones to suicide. And it's not, it's hard, but it's something that it, it's hard to really um, come to um, you know, to judge anyone that committed suicide or something I'm like that. I'm sure you've had this since this uh, closer, but I've had multiple students text me um, since this COVID shutdown saying, I got to get back to training. Like, I need it for my mental health. Like, I, I, is there any way I can train or come to your house or something? Like, I've had uh, at least five or six. Look, Rob, um, you just touched the point that I'm so passionate about because what I never knew in my life as a coach is that jujitsu could help so many different people that are going through such a hardships, you know, like in life as a, uh, you know, with depression, anxiety. And as soon as I had my first case of someone with terrible PTSD, a friend that couldn't get out of the house if it was dark, uh, couldn't be around kids because where he was in war, he saw many dead children. And we saw how jujitsu changed him, you know. And then after that, people with drug addiction. Look, I'm not a mental health professional. Um, I've been trying to learn as much as I can. I, I have been devouring <laughs> everything I can in psychology and psychiatry. And that's maybe a dream, maybe one day to go to school to learn more. Because I take interest in, in, in just trying to understand people. But man... Um, we realized that jujitsu is almost magical. You know, I, I don't know how to explain. Um, the brotherhood, I was talking to one of my students who is a state trooper today, and um, he came to the school, we were talking a little bit, and uh, he, he's, he was saying like, he, he's realizing that more than the physical exercise, he misses a lot just the, the being around the guy that are on the same mission. And I have students going through depression, like you said. Um, and that's why I start like recording some things on my YouTube channel. Not that, not that I'm trying to be a YouTuber or anything like that, just because I had extra time and I had to put this mic to work, the camera to work. I'm like, ah, oh, just let me try to learn this thing. But many of the things I recorded uh, were based on people that reached out to me to ask Luigi, I had one guy, man, he joined us uh, two months ago. I mean, two months before we closed. And he was bat battling anxiety really bad. And he, he's, he has been missing like crazy. So he asked me, he keeps sending me emails and uh, keeping him on the loop. And he asked me like, uh, could you talk about uh, some things like, are we our own enemies? And I guess like some internal struggle that he has probably like trying to fight his own depression, anxiety. I'm like, I don't have those answers, man. You know, I can only share what I know, you know, and in, in, in my biggest advice is like anyone that really needs should go uh, see a professional, a mental health professional, but I'll be here and I will be your friend and I will listen to you and I will train you in jujitsu and I'll give you my opinion. You know, so I guess like we shift our mission sometimes and I feel like, it's, sometimes it's more than teaching a Baron Bolo. <laughs> it's oh, to, you know. This afternoon, my, I have three boys, and my middle guy's like 13, going on 14, you know, right in the middle of puberty. And, he, you know, he has his, you know, moments where he's, you know, miserable and stuff because of it. Yeah. And um, he, he was, you know, in a real mood today. And I'm like, hey, let's go hit the mats. And he's like, oh, I don't want to. So I got him out there for an hour. We threw our mats down outside, and I trained with him. And he came in the house, and he was laughing. And my wife's like, wow. What a difference. Look, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So at some point in my life, I had a really bad anxiety. 
when I got divorced and I, you know, not seeing my daughters all the time and, and I end up quitting my job. And anyway, I, I had a start having like anxiety uh, attacks, you know, like almost panic attacks. And I couldn't understand, you know, being a big guy and a, a kind of alpha male, all of a sudden, like I'm feeling like, you know, long story short, I decided to do therapy. And I always mention this in my podcast and everywhere I can, because I believe in norm, normalizing what other men feels, right? Uh, especially men, you know, in this situation. And I will we'll go over that in the future. But she got so interested in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, my therapist, my psychoanalyst, uh, analyst, you know, psychologist. And because I would talk so much about Jiu-Jitsu, you know, like I hated everything I was going through, but I love Jiu-Jitsu. But one day, even Jiu-Jitsu was too much for me and I wanted to quit. And I was underperforming, I was too competitive. And she started like researching more. She asked me if she could come watch a class as a friend. She watched. And the next day, she said like, you can do whatever you want with your life. I don't care what you do, but you're not gonna stop Jiu-Jitsu. I'm like, no, I need to organize my life because I just quit my job and I, you know, I'm missing my daughters and no. You need jiu-jitsu because jiu-jitsu is your, it's your pill that takes one and a half hour, two hours to swallow, which is the duration of the class. It's different than me giving you an anti-anxiety medication that you just pop and you're like, Ugh, you know, which some people need it. Don't get me wrong. Antidepressants and anti-anxiety. But she said like, I'm not going to put you in any medication, but you're going to go to jiu-jitsu. I'm like, but I don't understand why. And she was saying about, she started explaining to me the effects on your serotonin mechanism and your endorphins and, and how it affects your dopamine, uh, you know, release and absorption. And especially the thing that stuck to my mind, Robin Rich, is because like, don't you see like what you guys go through every time you're doing that rolling thing? She didn't know the term, so she used another, you know, like term in Portuguese. I'm like, yeah, we fight. And I said, no. You there and you five minutes, six minutes, you holding the guy and you know, like you breathing and you, you know, tired and all of a sudden when time is up, what do you do? You go, ah, but that was awesome. Slap and bump. And she said, like, that's everything. All you need is that's what you need. And that's your body telling your mind, like, you calm now. And after that, um, I had almost quit and I decided to fight the, the equivalent of the world's masters back before they had the world's masters here was the international masters in Rio. And I was a brown belt and I fought, I did seven matches, four in my division and I won and I took second place, no, third place on the absolute division and I did three matches. So that day, I fought seven times, and when before I, 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 I was about to quit. So I had my real experience in my life, you know what I mean? Like how that helped me, and, and that's what I try to help people with. It's just like maybe have them have the same feel at the end of the training to go just have like, uh, you know? And, and it's just like the deep breath that's the gold. That's the gold in jiu-jitsu, man, is the last deep breath when you finish rolling. And, and that's your, your pill. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. And then, Rich, I'm sure you'll agree, like how many people that we know within our academies that, you know, have battled all kinds of things in their lives, and they'll always tell you, like, this is my center. Like, I come here, and my problems wait for me at the edge of the mat, and I, I shed them at the edge, and, I, I, and, and an hour and a half, two hours later, They'll be still waiting for me, but I'll be so much better served to deal with them. I, 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 I agree. Um, um, there's, a, there's a type of therapy in uh, psychiatry they call ACT, which is acceptance commitment therapy. And they really, it's really having into living in the moment. Of course, we cannot just live in the moment because we have to prepare the future. But it's a psychiatrist called uh, Russell Harris, and he has really good books. He's Australian. 
And, and then I could see the parallel between um, what my therapist said back in 2001 to uh, 2000, 2001 to what I learned from his course. And, and that's the thing, like you said, when we step on the mat and for two hours, we're not thinking about the world outside. So we give our minds a break, if that makes sense. You know, we, we, we totally disconnect from the outer world and just focus on the task ahead. And, and that alone is healing, you know, just to be there focusing even small little things, um, not just the moves and how you perform. And, and that's what I tell all my students, especially the guys with anxiety and the girls and with depression, like, don't, don't try to win now. You're, you're, you're winning your gold medal now. It's not how many times you tap or sweep or guard pass anyone. Right now, your goal is how much you can disconnect from the world and try to feel the person, try to feel how the gi, you know, feels in your hand and, you know, the smells and, and the sweat dripping. Because if you can get so in this immersion, you know, like in what's going on in that five minutes, you can really give your brain a break from the things that are creating that stress mechanism, you know? And we need those breaks because if we don't take those breaks, it all leads to depression, um, anxiety uh, uh, disorders, and in, in even like more serious situations, I guess. You know, I'm, again, I'm not a mental health person. It's just, it's my own experience and what I try to promote to people, I guess. No, I agree 100%. It's funny because... Uh... This is one of the reasons I, I, I'm so, I get so uh, irritated when they classify us as a gym uh, in the state of Connecticut, you know, and, and across the country, you know, martial arts schools kind of fall under gyms. But um, Pedro Sauer will, will always say, we're an academy, not a gym, because, you know, we're a place for higher learning. It's, yeah. You know, you can go to the gym and run the treadmill, lift weights, that's a gym. You can play, play basketball in the gym, that's a gym. Here, it's, you know, you're learning something that is, you know, mind, body, spirit is totally, totally uh, more than that. You know, and um, I know at least in my career, you know, 20 plus years in law enforcement, you know, and it really took me, I retired from my first career 20 years and then I still work um, in a smaller town, but, uh, you know, part-time, but it wasn't until I really retired from that job that I uh, was able to slow back a little. And that was good in some sense, but bad in others, because now I had time to sit and think of all the things I'd seen and done and, the, you know, fatal car accidents and murders and suicides and domestic violence and, you know, kids abuse and everything else. And that's when it, your mind starts going. And if it wasn't for jujitsu, I mean, I would be a, a mess all the time. <laughs> you know, so it really does uh, uh, give you, like you said, you know, it gives you a, an outlet. But, but so just, just look at your school, you know, you have you helping many other law enforcement people uh, to have that relief. And you have rich, for instance, imagine like for a parent that maybe have a, an autistic kid or somebody in the family that is autistic, right? And now you're in a place that promotes autism awareness. And I'm not saying this to, you know, uh, just to be flattering, but, but that's the truth. It's just, um, I, I always remember one quote from my Kung Fu teacher. And he used to say that to be a martial artist is to serve your community either teaching them how to defend themselves or to do uh, organized soup kitchens or food drives or anything that you can help people to become uh, better people, right? To go through life better. And I remember him because it wasn't a martial arts school at all, actually. It was a very different setup. And that stuck to me until I felt how jiu-jitsu could help me. And then when I realized I could help other people. So imagine like how much you help law enforcement people that you guys see horrible things. You see the worst in humanity, you know, for the most part. And, and that's a side that many people don't see it because they rather, of course, it can be traumatic to realize that the world is not a safe place, right? And at the same time, again, um, when you guys hold the, uh, host the Black Belt for Butterflies, when you have 100 plus people in, on the same mats with 20 Black Belts in the same mission that nobody's there to win medals, 
But what is the big, biggest score is to get those 100 people more conscious and knowledgeable about autism and how we cannot maybe, I remember uh, Pat, uh, I forgot his name, uh, Italian name, 10th Planet guy in Fairfoot. Sorry, Pat. You know, he's a great guy. Um, like, what's the, uh, Caninola? I, I forgot his last name. But Pat talking about his kid. And he's, Campanola. Campanola, yes. <laughs> Uh, he's really good friends with Travis from 10th Planet Fairfield too. And, you know, like one of those things, like from hearing everybody testimonials, I remember one thing that stuck to my mind as well, when he was talking about his son and how we should not judge maybe a kid that we see throwing a tantrum in, in, a, in a grocery store because, you know, maybe that kid has... It's in the spectrum, and we don't know, and we're just thinking that it's a misbehaved kid. And I thought to myself, like, man, a few times I did that. You know, like, I thought, like, wow, that's, those, those parents are failing, you know? Like, being judgmental because my daughter's always w behaved well. But then when he said that, I'm like, wow, I never thought about that. You know what I mean? And, and Rich, this has been... Back. It, and that was, like, two editions ago here in Connecticut? maybe at three, I remember when he gave his testimony, they're all like, you know, his testimonial. And I'm like, okay, that changed me. You know what I mean? And that changed me in your school, doing one of your initiatives to educate other people. So I bet like other people learn other things as well. You know, uh, Robert DeFranco talking about his family, you know, his son, and you know how people go through things and you learn Amen. And jujitsu is the vehicle, the vehicle to educate people. Well, I think you also, as, as, uh, as people, but as, as well as black belts, you have such a, a platform to reach people. Automatically, it's like you're kind of put on this little bit of a pedestal where students sit there and look at you, and it's like you have such an opportunity to reach them. So when you put 20 of them in a room, you know, that's, that's pretty powerful. That's a, that's a pretty awesome thing. So I do want to ask you something though. You kind of brought it up a little bit earlier about, you know, you were competing. Now, I think I've talked to a ton of different people that have sitting there and said, well, you know what, after this, I'm going to do this, or after COVID, I'm going to do this. Are you going to go back to competing again? I really like competing and, um, <laughs> And the reason why I, I, I stopped competing, it's because I felt that I was being selfish many times, uh, thinking too much about myself uh, when, I, when I needed to, to train, you know what I mean? And, and then at some point, um, I, I, I had to pay attention to the white belts and other people and et cetera. So I'm like, ah, I'm not doing a really good job competing because I cannot dedicate it, dedicate myself to compete, to the training, I'll say the, the, the camp, let's say, because I'm focusing on my students. But um, I definitely, this year, it's part of my, my goal to go to the world's masters and do a better job this year. And I, I spoke to some black belts from my school in the San Diego region, whenever you start doing your training, uh, just let us know and we'll be here to help you out. But I think I can only do that once we reach the, less phase that we can go back to the old normal <laughs> and then uh and then i i just i love the feeling you know i always have two uh three steps is first of all why am i doing this i hate this i'm nervous i'm anxious and you know and, and i competed like a hundred times in my life but i still feel the same way when i'm on the mat i'm like i'm loving this and at the end i'm like i want to do this again <laughs> <laughs> but I always like uh, I go through that and uh, it is just fun man I, I have nowadays going to the world's masters for instance and seeing all the the other teachers and hanging out with them and last time I was hanging out with the guys from Sherry Row and meeting different black belts and it's, it's just fun it just it became fun I still want to win I won the gold and uh but it's just, it's just fun. You know, I just like the process. If, if you were to give advice to someone who's just starting out 
and they're just going to, should I compete? Should I not? And then they decide to, what would you, what would your advice be to them? Um, again, in the beginning, I, I say um, always, which is the trivial, um, just let go of your ego. Um, there's a huge learning uh, process and you need to make sure that you cover all the basics before you jump into a competition, you know? So um, I say that in the beginning, the winning is to go home and remember one move or maybe one detail, one grip, one thing. And I keep telling that to my white belts, like don't count your taps, how many times you tap someone or how many times you tap to someone. And it's just like your goal now is every day it's a gold. It's not like everybody gets a gold medal, <laughs> uh, but it's, Every day, your goal is if you can remember something and you can write down something. And so I tell my students, I always have a journal. Um, for years, I had books and books of notes. Have your journal. Um, feel free to ask me things. Number two, once you're ready and your coach tells you they're ready, make sure that you cover the basics so you have a few sweeps, a few guard passes, and et cetera. And then after that, I think every good coach will normalize what your students could be feeling, you know? And that's, I think, uh, having competed a lot, it helps me to have more compassion towards my students when they say like, I'm too nervous, my hands are too cold, <laughs> you know, I wanna go pee, I wanna go poop. You know, I'm like, hey, don't worry, I feel the same way, you know? And then the people look at you like, like you said, oh, if the black belt feels like that, it's okay if I feel like that too. So that's what it is, you know, put the time and have the de dedication and create short-term goals, mid-term goals, and long-term goals. I had a, a friend of mine that we just actually had on the show, Chris Bumgardner. He's a, also a Pedro Sauer black belt. He has a school down in Delaware. He says that um, he feels more pressure when he competes now as, as, a, as a coach than he did coming up the ranks because <laughs> he, he's like – It's terrible. It, and, he's a, and he's a cop. So he's like, he's been in life and death situations, but he's like, listen, uh, when I go out there to compete now as a head coach of my academy, I have way more pressure on me than I ever did as a student. So I had to go through this process too, because first I was fighting to not disappoint my students, you know, and um, so I'm like, I hope I don't disappoint my students. And in, in a few times when I lost, I felt like I let people down. But I changed and I worked that, within myself so if i could give an advice to any other black belt i would say uh so first of all first of all it's like make sure that you're not neglecting your students um and being selfish because you want to be a competitor and a teacher so sometimes it's hard so we need to you need to make sure that you have a good structure but number two is now the way that i think is i want to give an example by never quitting never giving up in fighting up to my last second, my last breath in a match. So if I feel like if I, if I show that display, that I fought up to the last second, um, my students will be inspired, you know, regardless of the result. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's funny, uh, you talk about inspiration. The, the whole reason this podcast exists right now uh, here on The Code with Rich and I is uh, because of you, really. Oh, really? <laughs> you invited me, well, both of us at one point were on your podcast, I believe, but you had me on uh, your Fight Team podcast. We talked about uh, self-defense and, you know, the police and stuff like that. And it was after that podcast, when you shared that, I got a lot of emails and messages from people. They're like, man, you got to do a podcast because that was great. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and for the longest time, I kept kind of putting it off. And then I did another one with George Law. And it just kind of, and Rich had done a bunch with Black Belts for Butterflies. And before we know, it's kind of like we started talking and we're like, you know what? Maybe we should do this. And it really started to do. So thank you. No, I think it's awesome because actually that episode is one of the episodes that had the most views or actually listeners. Uh, I don't know how you post about it when I go to, I use LibSync, uh, LibSyn, uh, Liberated Syndication, I guess. That's the name of the, the software that distributes. And that episode is still one of the, if not the number one, um, I'm going to double check and I'll let you know, but we had a tons of listeners views on Facebook. We don't on YouTube because sometimes people don't sit to watch for one hour or so, but listeners, because we are everywhere too, uh, man, it was like, it took off. That was pretty cool. One thing I tell you, man, um, 
I, I think that we learn so much from other people's experience. And it, it's great to just sit down and hear other others' experiences, you know, from you guys. And uh, I think it's so enriching, in, you know. So that's what the reason, because I'm so curious about people, <laughs> you know, that I want to ask that, you know. I know I talk a lot, but trust me, uh, I, I really like to learn from other people. I know you do. And that's not, for our listeners and viewers out there, that is not a bullshit statement because – you are what a fourth degree black belt, multiple time world champion, and you have registered to come to some of my classes and classes that uh, you know have been put on by you know other instructors that are well below your rank, and, and you will go out there as a student and and you're happy to do it, which is pretty pretty amazing. Uh, honestly, man, I, I think like we learn from everyone. You know, I, I remember like one time I went to your school, and Rich was working his close guard game. And uh, he, you were showing me like some setups of things you were doing, and and Rich was a brown belt in purple belt or no, I think you were a brown belt, and I'm like, well, that's pretty cool, you know what I mean? So I think, especially in jujitsu, because people have different takes, we learn from everyone, and and that's one of the reasons that um, maybe I separated from uh, not my first coach because that's I'm, I never left him, but. I, I never enjoyed when people make less of other schools or teachers or players, you know, because at the end of the day, I think like everyone has something to teach. One, you know what I mean? It's a different style, a different game. And so maybe because back then coaches were afraid of losing students, so they didn't want students to look outside. When I start like going more outside, I started seeing seeing that. I remember training first time with Lucas Lepre in New York at uh, Fabio Clemente's place, and he had just maybe he was a new white uh, black belt. He was a new black belt, and dude, like I learned so much from him, you know. And then I guess that's what makes people. My mom always said like every wise man, not that I'm wise, but every wise man knows that he doesn't know everything or something like that. Translating from Portuguese. And, and and I think that's that's the whole thing, you know. I don't want people to see me as a oh he's a fourth degree black belt, so he should know more. No, sometimes people do more research than I do, <laughs> you know. They try different things than I do. You know who always impressed me with that kind of a, be- uh, a mindset, and they're actually a student of yours, Dennis Hill. Oh, Dennis, Dennis Hill is very much like you're describing. I'm fortunate to be around many guys in my association that they are masters or great masters in other styles. And that inspired me to, to pursue the same thing. So who, who have you not trained with that you'd love to go out and train with? That I never trained with? Yes. Um, let me think Is there here. anyone out there? That I would love to learn from. Um, you know, I was always curious about maybe um, feeling, and I know that he will kick my ass, but like say Bushesha, uh, I, I competed against Roger Gracie, so I know the, the feeling and the pressure and the accuracy. Uh, so I was, it's not that I would like to challenge them at all. Um, not, nothing like that, not on those lines. Um, but it's just because I like their style, you know. I I seen Rodolfo Vieira training and competing many times, but I, I didn't have the chance to train with him. I would love to also train with him. Just because you watch and see how they do so many great things. Um and then of course I'm talking about the the newer guys, you know, but I would love to be able to learn from Pedro. And and unfortunately like my agenda didn't really like uh, um matched. Uh, from Pedro Sauer, because that was always somebody that I always growing up in jiu-jitsu. We, those are the guys that I would be looking for VHS. You know, Pedro was one, so you're lucky. Um, I've seen um, Macajon, Marcel Stambolski from Gracie Sports. So I went to visit him a few times, and and I rode with him, and did like, he's no joke, you know. And, uh, and, and of course, the huh? hands are huge. The hands, legs, arms, and everything, you know. But he's an amazing guy, and he has a really uh, unique style. Um, that, uh, people that I never had a chance because of teams thing, I always like Hoyler Gracie uh, style, Ryler. 
so I wish I had a chance to learn a little bit from him as well. I mean, there's so many people. <laughs> it's just like I can go on and on, you know. Fabio Gurgel. Um, oh, there's so many people. All right, you got one. One? Just one. <laughs> That's, That's a hard, hard one. A hard question for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't put you on the spot for that. That's too tough. It's, it's, That's you know, you know who I was totally impressed with? It is part of your associate, well, part of American Top Team is uh, Hanato Tavares. Oh yeah. I trained with him. I was like blown out, blown, blown away. Just blown and, away. Hanato, it, it's two guys that I really like because they're small and they are so freaking accurate. One is Renato Tavares and Pahumpa, Marcos da Mata Pahumpinha is like uh, he always cornering the ATT guys. But Renato fixed my guard game in a tournament coaching me when he didn't have to coach me and um i was fighting a huge guy really really strong and i was having a hard time keeping him in my guard and hanat was outside and he said a couple things that fixed my cross open guard game and i never forgot and it became like my number one fundamental when i teach other guys and that was from him yelling uh, for me, you know, in the corner, like, Luigi, keep your toes on the guy's hip and blah, 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 and a few things. And that little tweak and adjustment changed my game from a tournament in Florida in 2011. I rolled with him when Rich brought, when Rich brought him up for uh, Black Belts for Butterflies, and I just couldn't – I mean, I could do nothing to him. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> he was laughing the whole time. It was pretty amazing, actually, to roll with someone like that. And he wins. He wins everything. So funny story was that um, I had met Hanato Tavares before, and he went to do a seminar at your school, and that was the first time I met you. Yes. So he pulls me out to be Azuki. So I'm underneath him. He's putting on pressure, and he starts talking, and explaining. And all of a sudden, the lights <laughs> start going out. I'm like, don't pass out. Don't pass out. Don't. He barely, like, budges and starts moving on. And it was like this little pinhole of light opens back up. And it's like, I kind of sat there for a second. He's moving. No one ever noticed. But I was, like, that close from being put out on the, front, on the mats. So, so, okay, going back to one person that I would love to spend as much time as possible with him would be... Ricardo Liborio, and he came here many times to my school, and he's, he's an encyclopedia of jiu-jitsu. He is simply ridiculous. <laughs> so uh, if, uh, if a, a dream maybe would be to spend six months being a student under him, maybe not wearing any black belt, and just listen. You know, because uh, he gave me, he's one of my mentors, you know, so um, he's a, just a well of wisdom, you know, yeah, that's great. for sure. I have to apologize. I, I think I said, I uh, said you were a fourth degree, but you're a fifth degree black belt now. You got promoted this year, correct? Yeah, I got promoted this year, but the right time would be at the end of the year. Um, but my first coach, Buddha, that is like my brother, um, he, he promoted me a little bit earlier, uh, at the end of last year, but we'd be at the end of this year when we redid the calculation. So I'm not really like promoting him as a fifth degree. I'm like, ah, I'll keep a fourth until like it's the right time. You know what I mean? But I think um, it would be like September this year. That's when I'm like, okay, you know, but he put it on my waist and uh, that's fine, you know. That's I love him. He's a good guy. I still look down at my own, my black belt. Rich and I talk about this. I'll look down sometimes and I've had my black belt now, you know, going on nine years and I'll look down and for a second, I'm like, Oh, whose is that? Oh, that's mine. You know, it must be something to see those five stripes across it. <laughs> it, it just goes by so quick, man. It just goes by when I, I actually, I'm trying to make a compilation of pictures since I moved to here and looking at my, first black belt with no stripes to getting one stripe and pictures with two stripes. And I'm like, where this 17 years, you know, went, it's just like crazy, you know, but I'm feeling good. I'm feeling young, <laughs> 48 years old. I'm feeling young. That's good. You know? That's good. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I got to tell you, it's always just, you know, great talking with you. And um, once this is all said and done and you're taking visitors, we got to come out and see you. And, and I know we talked earlier this year, you and I, about yeah. coming out to our school and doing a seminar. So you were going to do a seminar for charity. So I will be always my pleasure. I, I think it's, I love, I love doing a especially char, uh, charity thing. And again, like I want to have more interaction between our teams, and uh, and I want to I want to have you guys in my podcast again. Um, and I'm separating my podcast in two categories now. One is the fighting podcast, and the other one is the Gray Matter Project, uh, which is maybe I'm trying to promote more mental flexibility to get people to to just ask more questions. So, and I think there's a a good mix between law enforcement. Um, that we can, you know, bring back to the the topic. I think um, as far as training people, um, and and I would love to talk more about violence. <laughs> it's just like, not because I like violence at all, but because I think people need to be realistic. But I I expect you guys in my podcast. Oh, I had I had one more question. I have to ask you this. I almost forgot. Obviously, I, I, I'm a shooter. I've been shooting a long time. You know, SWAT and everything else. But um. I know you've been shooting a lot the last several years and a lot. I, I have my own ideas, but I want to see what yours are. What are, do you see any parallels in your mind between jujitsu and shooting? A bunch. Yeah. I think, uh, attention to the detail, to the fine details, I think makes a whole difference. So I feel like, um, well, for me shooting, it's good, uh, because it keeps me disconnected from outside world. Because when I'm there, I'm really focusing on being safe um, and keeping like those safety uh, procedures. So that's one. So there's a parallel between the two because the disconnection from the outside world. Um, the attention to the, the, the details, because anybody can just point something and shoot, <laughs> you know. So, um, and, and again, for me, is this uh, constant uh, pursuit of not excellence, but say, uh, what's the word in English? Uh, to be precise and um, yeah, precision. Precision, you know. So small details and things that in jujitsu makes a difference, and especially shooting makes a difference. So it's just one thing, like if you're shooting three yards from your target, that's one thing. Shooting from twenty-five yards with a handgun and or or longer. So um, I just I just love the discipline that we have to have. Uh, the respect, of course. So a lot of people see just like, uh, oh, it's a bunch of Second Amendment guys. It's not that. And and I have like mixed opinions that my friends from both sides of the spectrum might argue with me. But um, but I think it's there's a respect thing, you know, there's a uh, discipline, attention to the details. Mm -hmm. you know, I would love to see your opinion, your comparisons and yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the weapon to me is an extension of your body. You know what I mean? It's, it's you, when you really train enough of it, it becomes part of you, basically. You know, especially for yep. us in law enforcement, because we wear it constantly. We're, it's all, I mean, it's sitting right next to me now. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I mean, we're, always, we're always connected to it as part of us, feel naked without it kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, aim small, miss small. You ever see the Patriot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think the greatest, the greatest uh, you know, line in the movie is like, aim yeah. small. Well, but that 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 constant, like you said, you cannot be uh, sidetracked with anything else. You have to be total focused, much like rolling. When you're yep. rolling, you can't be texting or checking your Instagram page, or you have to be focused, or you're going to get choked. You're going to get your arms focused. Yeah. You're going to get your knee busted. And obviously, in shooting, it even ups the odds way beyond that because you make one mistake and you could shoot somebody in the, in the line or yourself. For and, and it gets even more so in, instead of just dead targets when you start shooting. You know, um, you know, live shoot houses and, you know, you know, clearing corners and rooms and up going up stairwells and, you know, and then you go over to like simunitions and you got a force on force people, you know, op force shooting back at you. And, you know, that's where that becomes almost like live rolling training where you can do stuff like that. And that's so, where you see the, the, the connection. So before I forget, uh, you said that I inspired you with the podcast but also you guys inspired me to get more connected with the law enforcement and train more of my students and learn more uh, when it comes to firearms so I could be a better self-defense coach. 
So you, you, because I believe that what you do, and I'm again, I'm not being flattering here at all because I don't like that. The truth is, you have a realistic um, approach to that training, uh, combatives training for law enforcement. And when I, I learned self defense, right, jujitsu self defense, and all of that, and in through these other things. But then I wasn't feeling confident about teaching self-defense and mentioning things that I wasn't really being proficient at. So that's why I tried to become really good, uh, knowledgeable person in firearms. So I could then, only then, start a combative self-defense class like you know you guys offer and i still need to go to the lockup uh training i couldn't go with dave again or but i'll love to cross train and do some type of trainings like that so that's a, a path that my my team has been going towards to that pretty much is mimicking what bushiro jiu-jitsu has been doing as well not to compete with you guys in any way but it's just because i feel like i want my students to be just very very safe so, you know what I mean? So my, um, if it's just very quick here, I'm not gonna expand on this. I always loved guns, but I was extremely against guns. And I thought that banning guns would be the answer until they banned guns in Brazil and violence tripled. And I came here and I could not understand the second amendment. And until I got a good explanation and then everything shifted in my mind. You know, and, and it comes with the realism and being realistic and not pessimist. And then I felt like, well, being realistic and being prepared makes me optimist, you know, and, and that's my model now <laughs> when I'm teaching the guys. Um, so I tell them, like, learn, be, be proficient in everything. And I'm trying to be proficient with knives. I'm, you know, carry my knives, I carry my gun and carry everything. I love what you said, which is an extension of your body. You know, and God put me in contact with really good people like you guys. And, uh, and one of my mentors now, who, which is Bill Rapier, is one of my best friends now, who is a black belt in jiu-jitsu, uh, high level in Muay Thai, 20-year Navy SEAL, and he was part of, you know, the top SEAL teams there. And I have been training with him every time he comes here, and then I host his training here. And I'm like, dude, like, it's awesome to see the, how they incorporate the combatives with the knives, with the, you know, shooting from retention, jujitsu, clinching, control. And I'm like, this is beautiful. That's how I always dreamed, you know? And then, uh, and that's the path now, you know? Yeah, any of those, any of those types of people, uh, at least the ones I've trained with over the years, I, we refer to them as generalists versus a specialist because, you know, like a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt competitor is a specialist at that one thing, right? The guys mm -hmm. you're mentioning, they can speak languages. They can do, you know, medical, tr medical, uh, pr almost operations on the damn battlefield if they're hurt. You know, they have firearm skills, tactic skills. They can parachute. They can scuba dive. I mean, they have so many skill sets. They're not just a one-trick pony. They're literally, uh, but we've had people come to the school and, and some of our guys have rolled with them, especially at the SWAT challenge. And they'll say later, oh, I rolled with that Army Ranger or that I rolled with that Navy SEAL. I thought they'd be a harder, you know, to tap. And I'm like, dude, they're in your world on the mat for five minutes. Go in their world and put their kit on. Jump out of a plane and and you know and, and end up you know going through the door with under a live fire. You would be lost. Yep. You lost. You have no idea what they know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just it's scary. <laughs> and I want to go one real quick thing about the Second Amendment. You know, I have a family member. I won't call them out entirely right here, but total you know kind of liberal and you know was always against guns and all that kind of stuff. When this whole COVID thing hit, they called me on the phone and they're like, oh, I'm feeling really vulnerable. How can I go get a firearm now? And I'm like, you can't, <laughs> I'm probably just, you're not gonna just get one. You have to go through a process. And they really believe like you could, like the news media will make you think, oh, you could just run down to some you know, gun show and buy whatever you want and come a back. Full auto. And I'm like, no, it's not like that here. So and they were, they're feeling vulnerable. They don't have anything to protect themselves. And when we started getting these, you know, weird things happening and people fighting over toilet paper and everything, they started to feel like, well, what happens if this starts to collapse and someone tries to break in my house? Now they're starting to feel scared. This is a very complex uh, subject because 
um, like I said here, at least for example, I live in Bethel. So Bethel has almost same Gini coefficient, meaning that people, it's pretty equal here, right? Uh, and so that's why it's a pretty peaceful uh, region. Same thing with Ridgefield or Newtown. People are so stuck in their bubble. And, and the reason why, so let me just very quick here. The reason why I, I loved guns and I, I had subscription for gun, my, uh, of gun, gun magazines in Brazil and I used to draw guns and I loved it. But my father got kidnapped in Brazil. We had six business invasions, uh, two home invasions. My sister had a gun pointed to her head. They stole her car and on and on and on. So I start blaming guns because I'm like, how come United States and, and all the other countries allow these illegal guns? And I'm thinking like, oh, okay, let's ban the guns and the problem will be solved. But matter of fact, it never got solved. And the number of homicides in Brazil kept growing, right? So they banned guns in 2006 and the number of homicides keep growing. When you talk to a liberal, uh, these activists, they say like, oh, but the the population is because of the growth of the population, which is not true because you ban all the guns, you know? Oh, it's because of the drug cartels and okay. And then there's a whole different discussion, but it's pretty much the Gini coefficient, which is this inequality and the resentment. And, and of course there, and on and on and on. Anyway, long story short, start doing my own research and studies on illegal guns. And it's pretty much like we passed the point in humanity, pretty much, where we can control guns. We just passed the point. We lost that. We should have controlled guns before, as soon as they invented the, 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 the gunpowder, black powder, uh, uh, powder uh, gunpowder, how it's called? Black powder, right? Um, yep, gunpowder. Yeah. So when the Chinese invented that, it should be banned back then because the Chinese invented the, the black power of the gunpowder, right? That was it. But literally, like, there's nothing that will ever control the human mind. And people might think the moms demand action, and, and they have the heart in a good place. We cannot say that they are bad people, but they're just not realistic. And, and I follow a lot Jordan Peterson because I think he makes, not that he makes sense, it's because his opinions are not based in uh, his emotions. And he says, and this is very true, and young, Carl Jung used to say the same thing. It can be very traumatic. It can even generate PTSD on anyone that really tries to dig deeper and learn about the reality, right? And that can be traumatizing when you realize that mental health is a subject that we cannot control. And people don't know what is a psychopath. People don't know what is a sociopath. People don't know who is a narcissist. People don't know all this. A, a quick advice for anybody that's listening to this podcast. Um, read a book from Simon Baron Cohen. Is Sasha, you know the Borat guy, the, the actor from Borat? So oh, yeah. his brother, yeah, his, his brother wrote this book. Sasha is the actor, Simon is the psychiatrist. He wrote a book called The Science of Evil. And it has nothing to do with, as a metaphysical uh, evil or religious. Is like, He breaks that down. Like, what is evil? Evil is a lack of empathy. You understand? So he describes the mechanisms in your brain where there's a malfunction that interferes with your empathy mechanism. And for many different reasons. It can be sometimes an accident that uh, affects the area. It could be a, mal a malformation during your, your, your development. It could be, and, and then he explains the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath. Like a psychopath is somebody born a psychopath, right? It's somebody that could just, so psychopath are the people that pass the lie detectors, right? And, and same thing, some sociopaths as well. Because for them, there's no emotion in what they did. So you don't have those variations in reactions in the body. And once you read the book and you see that this is physiology, neurology, psychology, and then you see like, well, people will find different ways to hurt other people whenever they want to. And that's life. 
And I learned that we need to move our compassion towards our loved ones. So in that situation that somebody breaks into my house and put a gun to my wife's head, I'm not going to think that that kid had a poor upbringing or was abused and was a victim of society or a family or whatever and try to de-escalate there. I'm going to smoke the guy because my compassion is towards my wife. That's the person at that moment that I need to see alive and my daughters and my mom and, and any, anybody, any innocent. You know, of course, if I can de-escalate the situation where we now can find the reasons why the person's like that and treat them. But sometimes there's no treatment. It's prison, <laughs> in my opinion, you know. So that's what it is. We need to learn how to shift our compassion. And that's pretty much what it is. Well, it's an honor to talk to you. And um, likewise, to more to your time. But uh, I know I think you might have the record. I think you might have. What do you think, Rich? We just had a long one a few days ago, but it's pretty damn close. Uh, I'm terrible. <laughs> uh, it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you tonight. Thank you so much for coming on. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm honored, and I hope we can do this again now on my other podcast, The Great Matter Project, where we can talk about violence, you know, and, oh, yeah. hey, and maybe how jujitsu can help some kids that have some violent inclinations and maybe see if we can use our love and compassion on the mats to change people. Perfect. Cool. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. Much, yeah. All right. Uh, wish you guys all the best, and... Uh, I want to see your school doing really well June 20th and we all reopen. Cool. Thank you. All right. Dude, God bless you guys. Night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.